we have this tradition at the end of our dialogues of bringing you all together just for a very few minutes, and it's such a short session. Um, it's just to reflect on the day. We've called it reflecting on reflections on creativity because I suppose that's one of the things that unites you, that you've all found creative approaches to solving problems in science. And when I say unites you, I think one thing that I always like to point out at a moment like this is you've listened to these laureates today. One might be forgiven for thinking that Nobel laureates are just one sort of scientist, but I think the diversity of the personalities comes out beautifully in a lot of you, so it's, it's very nice to have you together. So, who would like to start by reflecting on the day or on creativity? Yeah, I, I enjoyed so much, and I want to thank all the young people here for participating and you for making this possible. I talked in the break with several students and young scientists from uh, which are participating, and I was uh, really uh, getting more energized, enthusiastic about the discussion, the question, you know, how should I proceed? What should I do? Uh, how to make a career, you know? How can I contribute to these topics? And I must say this reflects exactly what I experienced and why I enjoy to be at the university, you know, with all these young talents. And every time, of course, we run a program over many, many years. Yeah, and we think as senior scientists that we are very clever. And then suddenly these young talents come in the lab fresh mind, and they are extremely creative, and they look from a different perspective, and they say, did you ever try this? No, I have never thought about that even, you know? So thank you all for bringing this excitement to us and the creativity that helps science forward to shape our future. Beautiful, thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go down the line, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really echoing what Frank has Dr. Faringa said, I mean, I, I think for the young scientists here, one of the really significant lessons will be that um, nobody ever told us to be creative. We just <laughs> sort of decided our own we had an opportunity to be. And um, some of us have, uh, in our different ways, been leaders in the scientific community or in the community at large. And nobody ever said that either. And so at some point, our generation will be off retired and doing wonderful things at age 120, and you'll be the leaders of science. And no one's gonna tell you at any point, now you're the leader. It's something that you'll realize that you have an opportunity, in some cases a responsibility, to carry out. And I know you'll do very well with it and make a better world. So thank you in advance for that. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm gonna take issue with that. <laughs> uh, uh, because when young people come into to my group, one of the things I tell them is, your job is to be creative. I don't have a plan for what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what the, the, the next exciting thing is and how we're gonna find our way to that next exciting thing. But I also wanna pick up on something that Adam said about how uh, you might have some conception about what a Nobel laureate is like. <laughs> and one of the pro common conceptions, I think, which is completely false, is that that no Laura is just something special. <laughs> um, now, some of them are. You know, when I think about, since this is the International Year of Quantum, uh, how Heisenberg goes to this island off the coast of, uh, of, uh, of Germany to, uh, to deal with his allergies, and in 10 days comes up with quantum mechanics. How does something like that happen? I can't imagine that kind of creativity. But yet, my whole career has been doing things that are creative in some much smaller way, some, some much more pedestrian kind of, of creativity. And, that, and, and both kinds of things are important. You don't have to be a Heisenberg or a Schrodinger or an Einstein or a Bohr to make a contribution to, to, to physics to end up, I mean, let's face it, getting a Nobel Prize is an awful lot of luck. Uh, uh, but, but, but that doesn't mean that, that you can't contribute to this marvelous adventure that is the, uh, 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 the progress of science. Now, one of the things that people often ask is, what does it take to make a creative environment? I think it takes uh, being in a place where uh, the, 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 the kind of thing you're doing is valued. 
that, that, that doing, learning something new about the na way nature works is something that your organization values and that is willing to embrace, that they're not going to say, no, no, we're not going to ha handle this golden rice because it's GMO. We're going to love this because it's a new way that, that, that uh, we hadn't thought of for solving this kind of, of, of problem. You need to have that kind of environment. Of course, you know, people are creative in every kind of environment. So there's no easy answer to what makes a creative environment. But what I'd like to see is organizations that are open, that, that say to their people, not, I expect you to accomplish this in the next eight months. No, I expect you to come up with new stuff. <laughs> it sounds like a beautiful nurturing world you have. And you probably got yourself several applications from the audience in, in the last two minutes. <laughs> okay. I. I would also like to follow up on luck. Luck is unbelievably important. <laughs> you know, when I made the discovery for which I won the Nobel Prize, we were trying to do something totally different. It didn't work. It was a failure. And then we looked to see why it failed. And nature was trying to tell us something, and we discovered what it was. And that brings to another point, is that failure is really important. You know, experiments, yeah. they don't have to succeed. Right? And if they don't succeed and you do them right, nature's trying to tell you, here is a discovery to make. So I love failure. I love it when students come to me and say, hey, I did what you told me to do. It didn't work. Ah, maybe there's a discovery there. This is excitement. But the other thing about creativity is that the education systems in many countries seem designed to knock the creativity out of children. All young children are creative. Yeah. And they go to school and it's knocked out of them. So that is not a good thing. And then the other thing for me personally is I've always felt I don't like people telling me what to do. If someone says, oh, you should do this, I want to do the opposite because I think they thought of it. It can't be that interesting. I want to learn about it. And so make sure that whatever you're doing as a student, don't let someone tell you, oh, don't do that. Do this. If you think that doing this is wrong, do what you think is right. I think that not being, want to t being, not wanting to be told what to do is universal among laureates, and you should try working with them, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, ben, I know you wanted to come back on some of the comments. You wanted to just extend some comments, and then I'm going to come to you. So. So you, I think you wanted to make a comment on the back, or you were just nodding in agreement with everything. Did you want to say something else? No. You want, you I, I just wanted to say that I fully agree with this gentleman. <laughs> and don't be afraid. I know all the young stars here. Don't look at the old chaps all the time, eh? Right. Because Van Hoff, the first Nobel laureate in chemistry, was 23 years old, only, your age. 23 years, when he did his major discovery about the three-dimensional picture of carbon the three-dimensional model that completely changed the way we look at molecules. 23 years, don't forget that. Now, you, now you've just depressed the whole audience. They're thinking, oh, I'm 23 <laughs> and I haven't done it. <laughs> Not my age. <laughs> Ada, last comment goes to you. Last comment. When I was a young, a young student, a young scientist, we looked at how things are working, how nature works, how nature she achieves what nature needs. Now we know, not all, but a lot of it. What we're looking, or should look now, is why is it so? Why did nature go this way, and not that way, and not that way, and not in a way that we couldn't think about? Mm. So I think that, in my opinion, what to do now is to understand why things are performed in nature in a specific way and not in another way. Listening to nature seems a good point to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Bill? I want to emphasize what, uh, what Rich said. 
I give talks to all kinds of groups of, of people. And one of the people I love the best to give talks to is a kindergarten class. I go in there and I throw liquid nitrogen on the floor and it boils and there's a cloud coming up and every one of those kindergarten kids is down on their hands and knees trying to see what this marvelous stuff is. If I do the same thing to a class of 16 year olds, they're all jumping up and getting on their chairs to avoid whatever this horrible <laughs> stuff is. The ones that don't are the ones that I'm guessing are gonna become scientists. And this is just what Rich was saying. So creativity, you gotta keep that spirit of being a five-year-old. <laughs> That is a good point to end on. Thank you all <laughs> very much indeed. And thank you to the audience for being here with us all day. You've made it possible by being here. We do it for you, and we're very grateful for your presence. So I'd just like to thank all our participants, and particularly our laureates here. Thank you very much indeed. Take it. <laughs> <laughs>